Oh, welcome uh, everyone to my lecture uh, today. Uh, I hope everyone is hearing me okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much for confirming that. I want to welcome everyone to my lecture today and I also want to welcome you to the new fall 2022 uh, semester. Uh, my name is uh, Professor uh, Kazim, and of course, I'm actually uh, going to be a lecturer in charge of this course. Uh, today, I'm actually going to be walking you through what I call Introduction to Machine Learning. I'm um, going to be guided by this uh, outline uh, where uh, I'm actually going to have uh, um, an overview of uh, machine learning. We are going to talk about how it works, uh, so on like that. Then from there, uh, I'm going to guide you through what we call the basic terminology and the process of machine learning. And lastly, um, today the focus is also going to be on making distinction between the types of machine learning uh, we have around. Okay, so um, I'm basically going to start, um, you know, with the machine learning uh, in the view, just like what I said the other time. Uh, but before I go into this, I think I need uh, to give you some kind of uh, background information uh, about how we find ourselves, you know, in learning dates. Uh, I'm going to say this, we live uh, in a world, you know, that is stochastic in nature. We live in a probability space. And you know what, the appearance of a uh, physical world, the appearance of reality is actually dependent of human knowledge. And you know, uh, for us to take a decision that we are not going to regret, we basically need to understand our probabilistic environment. Okay, we may want to understand our political environment, we may want to understand our economic environment, the medical environment, the social environment, the psychological environment, and so on like that. And of course, we basically need information, okay? We need knowledge, and you know what? It is information that will translate uh, into knowledge and that will enable us to take a decision that we're not going to regret. And what we're basically going to do is uh, to collect data. And you know what? Uh, when we collect data, the information that we're actually looking for is embedded in the data. But I'm going to say uh, the information is not readily available in the data. You know, something actually needs to be done. And what we normally, you know, if we want to go from statistical point of view, we basically are going to confront, uh, you know, the data with a statistical uh, model so, uh, for us to be able uh, to learn the information that will translate into knowledge that will enable us to, uh, you know, have the understanding of our environment. But you know what? Uh, you know, in, in machine learning, the difference between the machine learning and statistics is all that, uh, according to the American Statistical Association, you know, statistics is the heart and science of learning from data. You know, um, the statistician actually learn from data, you know, by confronting uh, data set uh, with, uh, you know, the statistical model that we have around. But what we do in machine learning, uh, we actually make use of algorithm. You know, uh, we basically believe the algorithm is going to learn the structure, you know, the the, the function, okay, uh, from the data set. And that is the reason uh, why we actually said, you know, the machine learning uh, is a tool for turning information uh, into knowledge. Okay, so uh, I think um, I'm basically uh, going to have a kind of um, distinction uh, between our machine learning work and how, um, you know, the traditional, you know, software uh, engineer actually handle situation. Uh, I'm actually going to start because, uh, you know, the, the machine learning actually 
use what I call algorithm, you know, to learn um, information from data. And of course, you know, the software uh, engineer as well use some forms of uh, algorithm too. So I think uh, there's uh, actually need to distinguish uh, between these two. So I'm going to say the software um, engineer, uh, what they actually do, you know, they uh, create uh, rules, okay, with data, you know, to create answers to a problem. You know, like I said the other time, we find ourselves in a world uh, where we basically want to provide uh, answers to practical problem. And of course, the software engineer is basically going to come out with some rules, okay? We, you know, we're going to combine the rules with the data to create the answers to a particular problem. But let me tell you this, uh, what we do in machine learning, okay, we we actually want to pretend as if we already have answers and we have the data available. And is there a way we can actually figure out the rules behind the problem? Because uh, let me tell you this, if you really want to solve a problem, we actually need to, um, you know, we need to, disc we need to actually figure out the rules, okay? The, the pattern, okay? The rules that actually, uh, you know, behind a, a particular, you know, uh, you know, problem, and that was actually first observed by Scholes in 2017. So, and that is a difference between, you know, when you want to look at it traditionally and that of machine learning. I'm going to have an illustration on this. Now, uh, if you take a look at what I'm actually showing now, okay, um, this is how the software engineer is basically going to address this. Uh, we got a rule, okay, we got a rule where the rule is um, x equal to, uh, uh, y equal to x times two. Uh, some of you, uh, you are familiar with uh, the domain uh, and range. Okay, we have a y equal to x times two. And of course, uh, if you're giving an input data, uh, we are x equal to one. If you try to plug that in, automatically uh, y is gonna be equal to two. So here you, you have a, a body data and the rule is available. And what you are actually trying to do is uh, to curate uh, answers to that. So when you take a look at what I have now, this is what the, uh, you know, the conventional, the engineer, the software engineer are actually, um, you know, they are involved in doing. But let me show you now how the machine learning work. In the machine learning, we actually have data set and we have answers and we only now want to figure how, for example, if this is the data, this is the input, and this is what I have as the output and what we basically uh, believe mathematically there should be a kind of rule, you know, that connects our input with the output. And that is what we're trying to figure out. You know, in the other time, I was trying to di uh, differentiate between our uh, statistician, uh, you know, and uh, the machine learning expert. The statistician actually started analysis, you know, by confronting the statistical model with the data set. So, which means uh, at the beginning, they basically going you know, to specify a model. But in the case of machine learning, we don't do that. Um, we actually going to learn the model. We're going to learn the function, you know, uh, during the uh, experimentation or doing the analysis. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Like if I have, if X, if X equal to one, actually, if X equal to one actually lead to Y equal to two, then I'm actually looking for a mapping rule, the like form of a function, you know, a function behind that scenario. And that is why we're thinking about that. We could actually think about different kinds of algorithm that could work at times it could be more than one. Okay, so if S equal to two and uh, if S equal to two and the Y equal to four, which means if I have an input equal to two and I have an output equal to four, or then automatically I, I need to figure out what the rule that is, you know, behind, you know, or raffle uh, the rule behind the scene. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. 
Okay, so uh, now you've been able to see the difference uh, between the uh, machine learning, how machine learning work, and how the traditional uh, method work. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm going to say that again. In the traditional method, we have the data set, and of course, we got the rule. And, you know, the, the rule that we got is uh, basically um, the our thought about how the system works. Okay, so that will be specified uh, in terms of a model. You get what I mean? So, uh, the you know, traditionally we have a rule available. We have the data set and what we're basically going to do is to generate the answers to that. But in machine learning, we basically have that I said, we have what could be, we have the likely answers. And what we basically need to do is uh, to figure out what um, the function, you know, the function that is behind that. Okay, that's what we're trying to figure out. Okay, so uh, I want to go into the basic terminology now, uh, since you already know how machine learning works. Okay, so uh, like I said, we have data set. We're going to be talking about fitting. Okay, we're going to be talking about some uh, features, like probably the features we have uh, in the data set, you know, in the conventional. Uh, statistical analysis, uh, you know, when you talk about data frame, of course, we got some variables in the data frame. In uh, machine learning, we call those variables features. Okay, so we call those variables uh, features. And of course, the uh, the idea here is just like, um, you know, we basically want to have a kind of generalization, you get what I mean? So we have some terminologies like model, like hyperparameter, like a loss function, like overfitting, okay? Of course, the overfitting could be some problems of uh, machine learning. And of course, we have what we call the loss, you know, um, just like in the conventional uh, statistical model um, that we have error, which is more or less a gap between the different, uh, between uh, the model and reality. Of course, in our uh, machine learning tool, we actually have a way uh, to investigate the validity of an algorithm. So uh, I'm actually going to uh, go over all this. Okay, so uh, starting from uh, you know, talking about the basic terminology now. Okay, uh, like I said, uh, if we want to start uh, investigating or uh, whether we want to use uh, statistical framework or the, uh, you know, the, the machine learning framework, we basically need what we call the data set. And I'm going to say, um, you know, uh, data is actually uh, any statistical, you know, it's an essential ingredient in any statistical investigation. Of course, we need to collect the right data around to uh, analyze. We can analyze that to be able to get the information that we need. So, and of course, the data set actually contain the features, you know, in your data set, you know, the feature uh, that you actually need that you you know, that is very, very important to solve the problem at hand. And that was why you basically need to collect the appropriate data. You get what I mean? So, and the, you know, the data set here yeah, actually contains some features. For instance, I may want to talk about the, maybe uh, 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 in my bank, I basically uh, want to figure out, uh, you know, what are the variables that I, you know, important to determine the probability uh, that a customer is going to default. You get what I mean? So uh, I'm basically going to, uh, my, in my data frame, I'm basically going to have, uh, consider the sex, consider, uh, you know, whether uh, the, the level of education of the customer among uh, the credit score, among other, uh, you know, features. So, in that I said, we basically have uh, some set of, uh, of features and those features have to be relevant, okay, uh, to the problem at hand. So uh, now the second one is what we call uh, the features, uh, of course, uh, which uh, we call the, the important pieces of data, you know, that we're supposed to understand the problem. Okay, which I just uh, described, you get what I mean? So, you know, those features are, uh, 
to be fed into the machine learning algorithm and you know to help the machine learning algorithm you know learn from it okay now the next thing that we basically want to talk about uh is what we call model okay uh, i'm actually going to say uh, uh from statistical framework a model is a mathematical representation or, or statistical uh, simplicity or representation of reality okay so uh, the representation of a phenomenon okay that a machine learning algorithm has learned uh, is what we call model let me tell you this uh, the difference between uh, just like what i said the other time uh, the difference between machine learning and statistics is just like um, we apply model okay to data in statistics okay we basically uh, confront our data set with model we start with the specification of a model but in machine learning we don't do that we basically um, going to learn that model okay uh, using the algorithm you get what I mean so we're going to learn the function we're going to learn the model okay uh, using algorithm you get what I mean so it's also I said learns this from the data you know uh, and it's shown during training okay and don't forget um, in machine learning generally uh, the set of data that we have will be partitioned into the training set and uh, the test set okay so uh in the splitting um we're basically gonna commit uh, the largest uh, uh, percentage of the data set to training uh, uh, you know we could use like 70 30 to 70 30 or 80 20 okay so but we want a significant part of the data set okay to be committed to training you hear what i mean so uh the output uh is the you know the model okay is the output you get after training an algorithm i just want us to take note of that but, you know um the machine learning don't forget we learn the model you know it's different from the way we handle that in statistics where we start from the model you get what i mean we start from the model we confirm the model to data set but in machine learning we don't do that we the model is going to serve as an output if you look at what i showed you the other time uh right here uh you're going to see uh that this is more or less like a model here and this particular model we figure it out here okay don't forget i demonstrated uh we know the data set we already have the answers and we basically want to figure out the model so which means the algorithm is basically going to learn uh the model you get what i mean and that's why we call that the model is actually the output that we get okay after training an algorithm you get what i mean an example of that could be a decision tree uh, algorithm okay the decision tree algorithm uh, can actually be trained to produce a decision tree model you get what i mean that we actually gonna use in taking the decision uh, at the end of the day uh, let me tell you this uh, we got a way to validate uh, our model don't forget the model is the output here uh, the model was actually learned um, using uh, the training set you know, I told you the other time, we're basically going to split our data set into two parts. We're going to have a training set. We're going to have a um, test set. Okay. Uh, by the time uh, the module, which is an output, is now learned, uh, you know, from uh, the data using the algorithm and the next thing we're basically going to do to validate um, the module now, okay, we're basically going to use the text data. Okay, we're going to use the test data that, uh, you know, the test data on that. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, the process, you know, in machine learning, um, we basically um, going to start the process uh, by actually uh, starting with the data collection. Okay, and when we start with the data collection, we basically going to go to 
uh, data preparation. And after the data preparation, we basically gonna go uh, into what I call model feeding. Okay, and after the model feeding, we're gonna go to model evaluation. And after the model evaluation, we look at the upper parameter turning. And of course, I'm basically gonna explain uh, this scenario uh, one by one. Uh, but before I go on, is there anyone uh, who need uh, clarification? Is there anyone? Uh, I wanted to be, you know, faithful with me here. So if there's anyone uh, who need clarification, uh, you can ask a question now, or you can even chat with me. Uh, is there anyone uh, who need clarification on this? Okay, so uh, like I said, I want to uh, explain uh, the process in machine learning now. Uh, which actually uh, start from the collection of data. You know, why do I need, why do we need to collect data? You know, uh, we need to collect data because we believe the information that we need uh, to understand the environment we find ourselves uh, can, you know, is embedded in the data set. You know, don't forget the other time I said, we want to understand our political environment. We want to understand our social environment, the medical environment. We want to understand uh, economic environment and so on like that. And of course, uh, we need uh, to collect relevant uh, data. Okay, so uh, it is the data that we collect that the algorithm we actually learn from. And don't forget what the algorithm is going to learn from the data is is basically going to be model. Don't forget about that. The algorithm will learn the model from the data. Okay, so that is uh, how the data collection work. Now, um, the next uh, in the process is what we call uh, data preparation. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, when we collect data set. Uh, the data set is uh, massive in nature, and of course, we basically uh, need to put that uh, in an analysis form, you get what I mean. So, you know, when, you know, formatting and then, you know, when you come trying to convert the data into optimal format, okay, where we basically want to extract our uh, important features, because the data set that we collect will have a lot of features. It is not gonna be all of them, you know, that are gonna be relevant. Okay, so we actually need to do um, a proper job, you know, extracting um, the important ones. Okay, the important ones that are actually connected with the problem at hand, you get what I mean? And of course, um, at times we could uh, perform uh, some form of a dimensionality reduction or uh, dimensionality reduction in the sense that in a situation uh, where you have thousands of um, features and of course is uh, having thousands of features uh, there could be uh, some problem and that is the reason why we, we got uh, several techniques to do that. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you guys have heard about what we call the principal component analysis that we uh, normally uh, apply to reduce uh, features. Uh, in statistics, there's something that we call regression and loss of regression. Uh, you know, they also do the job of uh, shrinking, uh, you know, some uh, unimportant variable to zero. You get what I mean? So. Now, uh, after the data preparation now, uh, the next thing we are going to talk about is training. Uh, I remember the other time, uh, the way machine learning uh, work, we basically um, going to split uh, the data set, uh, you know, into two parts. Uh, we're going to have uh, the training set, we're going to have the tech set. And of course, uh, the training set, um, a good number of uh, the uh, observations have to be committed uh, to the training set. Uh, you know, uh, there's no standard rule for that. You know, some could use like 80 to 20, or some could use 75 to 25, and some could use 70 to 30, you get what I mean? So, um, so 
that is what we actually uh, do uh, in this stage. We, that, that, that training stage in statistical analysis um, is also called a feeding stage. You know, uh, you know that particular stage is where you feed, um, you know, statistical model to data. But here, you know, in the machine learning, on the other hand, um, the, the, the training uh, stage here is where we learn the model um, from the data set. Uh, using uh, algorithm, you get what I mean? So um, I just wanted to take note of that. Now, uh, the next thing we're basically gonna do is what we call evaluation. You know, I, I told you that probably here, if you use 80% uh, of the data for training, and don't forget, um, you actually use an algorithm to learn the model uh, from that. And of course, how do you know uh, whether your model, the algorithm learn actually work, then we're gonna have what we call evaluation. So um, the 20% of the data now will basically be used to test how, you know, to test the model, to basically to see how well it performs. Okay, so that's what we mean by model evaluation. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, the one we call turning hyperparameter. Okay, the hyperparameter turning now uh, is a way of fine tuning the model to maximize its performance because there's possibility, how do I know uh, the performance? Of course, that's what we did in four in the evaluation process. You know, we got a lot of criteria to be able to know uh, how a particular model uh, actually uh, perform. So if it doesn't uh, perform to expectation, and of course, uh, there's a way we can actually fine tune uh, the model uh, to maximize uh, its potential. Okay, so this is how to, this is the, uh, the process involved uh, in machine learning. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a background theory now, you know, uh, for, so for some of you who are familiar with statistics, you basically, um, you, I know you are aware of the fact that the background theory of uh, uh, statistics is probability theory. Uh, and of course, uh, the mathematical theory as well. Uh, we also have the, uh, the in, in machine learning as well. Uh, of course, uh, you know the, uh, the the background theory is also mathematics. Uh, if you take a look at this guy now, if I have uh, x uh, divided by exponential raised to the power x minus one. And of course, we have a way to approximate that. I don't know for some of you who actually work with uh, Taylor series, McLaurin series, and so on like that. Uh, we find ourselves in a world uh, where we basically want to capture reality. And you know what? Uh, we're only going to uh, have an approximate reality uh, at the end of the day. So uh, here I said how an explicit function may be worked out uh, by the engine without having been worked out by woman head and hand and hands force. You know, when you take a look at what I have here, you basically gonna see that uh, this may be beyond a uh, woman comprehension or it could uh, waste a lot of time if you really want to figure this out uh, manually. And that is the reason why, um, you know, we have a software, we have engine around that can actually, uh, you know, do the job. And of course, uh, that is why we have a machine learning. Look at the word machine learning. It's basically we want uh, a computer, you know, to do the job. You get what I mean? Under our supervision. Okay, so uh, I said something the other time, the undertone, the, the background theory of machine learning is probability theory as well. Don't forget, uh, probability theory is also a background theory for statistics. Okay, and of course, you know, probability is an orderly opinion. Okay, inference from data is nothing other than the revision of such opinion in the light of relevant new information, according to uh, Reverend Thomas B. 1759. So, you know, I, I told you the other time we find ourselves in a world uh, where 
uh, we need information and of course the event around us is probabilistic uh, in nature and that actually happened because we live in a probability space. We had, you know, different things happen in different days. There's a lot of variations um, around and that is the reason if you actually call probability as an orderly opinion, then the inference, you know, which is a judgment now from the data, is nothing other than the revision of such opinion. And that is the reason why uh, the probability uh, is basically going you know, to be more relevant here. And we say because of this, we have to base our probabilities on the information available about an event. Okay, it has to be the information available about a particular event, you know, rather than counting the numbers of repeated trials. I think I'm going to use this opportunity, uh, you know, um, to revisit what we call the frequencies approach and the Bayesian approach in statistics, where the frequencies actually believe that we can figure how the probability of an event from a repeated numbers of trials. And, you know, if you want to look at the uh, what we call the limiting frequency approach, we say that uh, the ratio of the numbers of time uh, favorable to the experiment to the numbers of time the experiment uh, is performed. And, you know, the Reverend Thomas Bayes in 1759 actually uh, argued that, that we need to update uh, our knowledge. And, you know, for example, uh, you know, we need to base it on the information available. It should not just be on a repeated uh, trial so alone. You know, if I want to use example from the English uh, uh, Premiership, uh, where we basically want to predict uh, maybe the Manchester United, uh, you know, want to play against uh, Liverpool. Of course, the Manchester United uh, play against uh, Liverpool in the ongoing season. I think the uh, the Manchester United actually, I think the Manchester United won the game. Yeah, they won the game. So uh, let's say before the game, and we want to predict the probability of uh, a particular team winning, maybe Manchester United or uh, winning. Uh, you know, Reverend Thomas B said we shouldn't base it on the numbers of uh, time the Manchester United has won in the past to predict the probability of Manchester United winning. But instead, we should base it on some relevant information like what is the current form, okay? The current form of Manchester United, okay? What about their position in the league, okay? And what about the starting team? Because in the match, you know, um, if you don't, if you don't, if you get your first 11 wrong, okay, the starting first 11, if you get that wrong, there's possibility that you could even lose the match uh, at the first half. You get what I mean? You could lose the match in the first half. We get some match that are even decided, okay, in the first half or, you know, of the match. And that is the reason why it's like here we are putting into consideration, we're incorporating, uh, you know, what we call the conditional uh, event. That is exactly what we're trying to do here. Okay. So we're not just going to base it on the repeated, uh, you know, you know, we're not going to count the numbers of repeated trials alone, but we basically are going to consider some other relevant information. Okay. And that will help a lot. And that is the reason why we said the benefit of taking this approach is that the probability can still be assigned to real event as the decision making process is based on relevant features and reasoning. Okay, so uh, if you take a look at this, uh, the machine learning uh, approach, we basically have uh, different types of them, which we're going to talk about. Uh, if you take a look at this, this is a supervised one. You can see somebody acting as a teacher, and this is more or less like a student. So that's a form of a supervised uh, learning approach. And if you take a look at this guy, I think he's just doing that alone. Okay, he's doing that alone. If you take a look at that. And then we take a look at this guy here. It's more or less like uh, probably combining in uh, the two, so which I'm going to explain. Uh, but before I go into that, uh, I want to say 
uh, we don't believe uh, one particular algorithm could solve our problem. It's just like trying to say a particular model will actually address our problem. And that was why we said there's no, uh, no free launch theorem. Okay, uh, you know, the free launch actually states uh, there's no single algorithm. You know that work well for attacks, and that is why we find ourselves in a world, you know, where uh, we basically need to identify an algorithm that will work uh, for a particular situation. We got a lot of algorithms that we basically are uh, going to talk about. You know, the algorithm that we actually use uh, to learn uh, from data. Okay, we got a lot of them. Okay, so we shall, we're still going uh, to talk about. So, but you know what? Um, we, I, I'm going to talk about the types of machine learning now. Okay, we have what we call the supervised uh, machine learning. We have the unsupervised. Uh, and we have the semi-supervised learning. And we have the reinforcement uh, learning. So uh, let's talk about the supervised one. Okay, when you take a look at this guy now, um, you have a teacher, you have uh, a student, you know, and the teacher is actually, um, you know, you can see the teacher is uh, teaching uh, the students and you can see the grade of that particular uh, student. So I'm um, basically going to say in the supervised le uh, learning, uh, the goal is uh, to learn the mapping rules between a set of input and output. Don't forget, that is a major goal of machine learning. Okay, you know, I demonstrated there the other time or uh, what we want to do in machine learning is um, basically to learn the rules, you know, uh, behind a particular problem and, and an answer. You get what I mean? So we actually going you know, to have what we call the input. We are uh, going to have, um, you know, what we call uh, the, the output. And of course, I, I'm going to give you uh, an example uh, for that, you know, for, exa for example, you may want to talk about the input could be a weather forecast. Okay, you know, I wake up uh, this morning, um, I realized, you know, getting to the Twin City, uh, you know, the temperature was uh, so, you know, very, very cold this morning, you know, I was like, oh my God, what's going on, you know? So, uh, you know, the input could be weather forecast and the output, uh, could actually be visitors to the beach. You get what I mean? You know, um, what the term means, uh, you know, whether visitors are actually gonna go to the beach or, you know, depends on the on the weather. And you know what the goal is just to, you know, in the supervised uh, learning, we actually, you know, like I said, we wanna uh, learn the, the mapping rules that describe the relationship you know between the temperature and the numbers of beach visitors okay if i have uh you know temperature now recorded at you know, a different point in time and i have the numbers of beach visitors now the question now can we have a way to learn the the functions okay can we learn the the, the function that we actually explain the connection uh, between um you know the the, the temperature and the number of uh, beach of uh, visitors and let me tell you this um we the 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 label data okay is provided of pass input and output peers okay the pass input and output peers just going to be like okay at a particular point in time if x is basically on uh, the temperature the y is going to be the numbers of visitors to the beach and of course you can collect this uh over uh you know over time you get what i mean so it's going to be an order peer okay so it is called supervised machine learning because in the data set, uh, we're going to have what we call an output that we call Y. The output variable is the outcome variable. We also call that dependent variable. And then, uh, uh, you know, the assistance of the uh, output is basically uh, what makes it to be uh, a kind of, uh, you know, supervised uh, learning. Okay, and you know what? Uh, the moment we're able to uh, learn uh, the process, uh, you know, uh, you know, to teach the model how, how it should behave, then what we are trying to say in the beach example, 
Okay, the new input, you no, know, the new input now is basically going to be uh, the new, the temperature, you get what I mean? And then the new input can then be fed, okay, in of the forecast, okay, temperature and the machine learning algorithm uh, will then output a future prediction for the numbers of visitors. You know, what I'm trying to say in essence, it's just like if you're able to use algorithm to figure out the module, uh, which is the mapping rule. Okay, you know, don't forget the we know the we know the temperature, we know um what is it called, we know um the numbers of visitors. You know, that is synonymous with the example I was showing you the other time when s equal to one and y equal to that. Okay, the x is giving you know the temperature based on your data, you know the numbers of visitors, and what you're now trying to do is um by the time you train with data set, you'll be able to figure out the model. And when you figure how the model, okay, the algorithm will learn the model, you know, from the relationship between uh, your input and the output, okay? Now, when you're able to do that, then you can have a way uh, to evaluate your model. You know, you basically want to see how good is your model. We have a criteria that we use to figure that out. And the moment the model behaves well, then what we're basically going to do, we're going to use a new input data now, which is going to be temperature. Then when we use a new input data, then we'll be able to make a forecast of the number of, uh, you know, of visitors that will visit the beach. Okay, so that is exactly uh, what I was trying to say. And let me tell you this, in training, uh, I'm gonna say this, we basically want to maximize uh, what we call generalization. Okay, so that is what we basically mean. Okay, and I'm actually gonna give you a side effect of uh, this uh, learning. Okay, this the side effects or uh, you know of the supervisor uh, uh, learning uh, is that the supervision we provide could introduce what we call bias to the learning. I'm gonna say that again. The supervision we provide could you know induce uh, bias to the learning, and you know what uh, bias is um, you know is negative or uh, to uh, could have a negative impact on the behavior of the model the algorithm is basically uh, going to learn. Okay, so, and that is the reason uh, why uh, we basically need to be sure we actually need to accommodate uh, some robust way of making sure uh, that uh, the bias is not going to have uh, a kind of a negative effect on the quality, you get what I mean. Okay, so uh, still on the supervised learning, uh, you know, the example, the example I was trying to, uh, if you take a look at this example now, so um, uh, if the input, which is the temperature equal to 20, okay, and um, the, you know the visitor is high, because we could have um, the, the label, you know, the the outputs could be categorical and it, it may not be categorical. You know, categorical in the sense that if we have levels like low, high, I mean, low, medium, and high, and, uh, you know, uh, quantitative, if you get just have, if we consider the numbers of visitors. So if you take a look at this, um, if uh, the input the temperature is 20, okay, using the model, of course, the, uh, you know, and the, and the output is uh, high, okay, we can be able to figure how uh, the model that could explain that. Or uh, we know the temperature to be 20 and the output, which is the number of visitors that visit the beach uh, to be 300. Of course, we can actually figure out uh, the model. So the first one here is uh, basically uh, classification. Uh, you get what I mean? So because the output variable is uh, categorical and why the second one is going to be regression. Okay, if you take a look at uh, what we have uh, right here, the classification, there's a boundary here, which is a boundary of classification, where you can see uh, what you have is different from uh, what you have uh, here. So take a look um, at that. Okay, so uh, the, the classification, uh, you know, we have our uh, input where x is 20 and the output is 50, okay? That actually 
occur here and of course this side is good and that side is actually uh, a bad because uh, you know what we're trying to do is uh, to basically classify items into their appropriate group so in machine learning too we handle what we call classification of uh, items and of course we also we do a uh, prediction problem Okay, and of course the prediction problem is gonna be a regression one. Okay, so I just wanted to take note of that. Now, I basically wanna go into unsupervised uh, learning now. And you know what, when you are talking about uh, unsupervised uh, learning, of course, if you take a look at this guy now, just let us somebody that is uh, actually teaching itself the algorithm that you want to use to learn the model from data is not being supervised. And what do I mean that? You know, in a non-supervised uh, uh, machine learning, you don't have outputs. We only have inputs. I'm going to say that again. Okay, you know, in, in a supervised one, you already have a clue, just like, oh, this is the problem. You, you have the answer. The answers are the outcome. That is in a supervised learning. You get what I mean? Or what you just need uh, is to figure how, you know, the mapping rules, you know, that connect uh, the input with the output, okay? And that is why it is called supervised because it has, uh, uh, you know, output label, okay? It has the output label. But you know, when you take a look at the unsupervised one, we only have input data. Okay, there's nothing, there's no, there's no label, there's no output. Okay, like, that's what I mean. Okay, and let me tell you, uh, it may be very surprising to know that it is still possible to find many interesting and, you know, uh, complex para hidden within data without uh, you having the uh, outcome variable. Okay, and I'm basically going to show you an example now, take a look at this. Okay, uh, you know, if you take a look at this, uh, basically uh, uh, you actually want to do some kind of separation. Okay, uh, you know, an example here is that you are asked to sort uh, different uh, color coins, okay, into separate pies. Okay, and of course, when you take a look at what you have, you know, nobody taught you how to separate them which means you are not being supervised. You get what I mean? But, you know, by you looking at the features around, you know, such as color, I, I want to believe uh, you can see which uh, color coins are associated and you probably cluster them into their correct groups. So that is what you're actually seeing here. Look at that. That can easily be done. You know, you are like separating them, okay, using the color. You get what I mean? So put the one of the same color aside, okay? Can you see what we're trying to do here? So this is an example of unsupervised, uh, you know, learning. And let me tell you this, unsupervised learning can be harder than the supervised learning, okay? Uh, because the removal of the supervision means the problem has become less defined. It less defined in the sense that you don't have any clue to the what the outcome uh, is basically uh, going to be. But I, I want to tell you uh, that uh, that is another interesting, uh, you know, learning process uh, in machine learning where there is nothing like, uh, you know, labor. You get what I mean? Uh, an example here is um, you learn to play guitar by being supervised by a teacher you know when you when, when you learn to play guitar by being supervised by a teacher it means you are doing what we call a supervised learning okay so which means if you have been learned uh, by uh, if you learn your uh, how to play guitar from a uh, teacher you know of course you will learn quickly you know you learn quickly by using the supervised knowledge of notes chords you know and so on like that but if you if you teach yourself like if you actually get that you know by you know without any supervision uh you may find it much harder knowing where to start and that is the reason uh, why unsupervised learning is kind of complicated more complicated you know compared to um supervised uh, uh, learning 
but I'm going to say, um, you know, and that was why we say being unsupervised, you know, when you are being unsupervised, it's like you are starting from a clean slate. Whereas okay, you're like somebody who is not being taught by anybody, you figure out in yourself, of course, you're actually uh, going to start from a clean state. And when you start from a clean state, there's not going to be, there's going to be less bias. Don't forget, in the case of supervised, there's going to be bias, more bias. But in the case of unsupervised, because you are starting from a clean state, okay, there's going to be less uh, bias and you may even find a new way of uh, solving a problem, okay, if you don't rely on anybody. Because um, if you rely on somebody, you're only going to learn the conventional way of solving problems. You know, it's only what the person knows. But if you let yourself, there's possibility you're basically uh, going to learn a new way of uh, figuring out a problem, which is more or less one of the advantages of unsupervised uh, learning uh, over the, uh, the supervised uh, one. And because of that, uh, we're basically uh, going to say uh, the unsupervised learning could lead to knowledge discovery. Okay, it could lead to uh, knowledge. Okay, it could lead to knowledge discovery. I just wanted to take note of that. Okay, it could lead to knowledge uh, uh, discovery. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to move now. Um, these are some examples of the, uh, you know, supervised uh, one. You know, I told you the supervised does not really have an outcome variable and. Uh, basically, what we do is uh, to do some sorting. If you are talking about uh, classification problem, here you have all of them. That is your original data set. And of course, uh, this is, uh, we make use of a cluster in our supervisor uh, learning when you're trying to sort out some items. Uh, right here, you're basically going to see uh, with colors, you know, this has been. That that's been cluster, right? Okay, so I wanted to take notes uh, of that. Okay, so uh, there's another types of um, you know machine learning that we call the semi uh, supervised uh, learning. Uh, in the semi supervised learning, uh, is a combination of uh, supervised and un unsupervised because uh, you actually going to have some output but not all inputs uh, that we have output. I'm going to say that again. Not all inputs uh, that we have output. You get what I mean? Some inputs we have output, some we don't have. But you know, there's a little clue uh, here. Okay, so, and that is the reason uh, why the semi supervised uh, learning is basically considered to be a great uh, uh, approach. You know, the learning process isn't closely supervised, okay, with uh, example output for every single input, but we also don't let the algorithm do it, uh, its own thing and provide no form of feedback, okay? So it's like, uh, this is like a middle road, okay, between the supervised and the semi-supervised. So, so uh, you know, way of uh, learning. Okay, so, uh, you know, being mixed together a small amount of uh, outcome data with a much more larger unlabeled data set, okay, it will uh, go a, a long way in reducing the burden of having uh, enough labor data, okay? So that is what I just wanted to take note here. Okay, so uh, you can read more here. Like I said, the submit supervised learning takes the middle road. Okay, so uh, the last cell of them is what we call uh, the reinforcement learning. Okay, in fact, uh, majority of uh, machine learning experts actually uh, seeing this reinforcement learning as their uh, favorite. Okay because it is less uh, common and much more complex, but it has generated some very great uh, results. So it doesn't use uh, labor as such, and instead uses reward to learn. 
Okay, it is actually called reinforcement learning because it's used so uh, reward or uh, to learn. Okay, uh, I'm actually going to use an example uh, in psychology. Okay, in psychology, they make use of uh, reinforcement learning uh, a lot. Okay, now in, in, in this approach, you know, occasional positive and negative feedback is used to reinforce behavior. Okay, you know, when you're working with animals, pets, maybe like dogs, okay, maybe you are training dog, okay, the good behaviors, you know, you know, dog good behaviors are actually rewarded with a treat. You know that, right? And that become uh, more common. But bad behaviors are going to be public, uh, punished. Okay, you have a dog now, and then you train the dog, and you realize that the dog actually uh, is doing a great job, just like uh, the dog, uh, the de detectives use in their investigation. Uh, if you look at, if you arrive uh, a foreign uh, uh, place, uh, you get to an airport, of course, at times you basically, you know, see uh, security, men with dogs and if dogs was able to um detect um, something of course you're basically going to see the way the dog will be treated and if it behaves uh, badly of course it's going to get uh, punished and that is the way the reinforcement uh you know uh, learning uh actually work and that was why we call that a reward motivated behavior Okay, it's called a reward motivated behavior. So, and you know what? This is very uh, kind of similar to how we as human also learn. Okay, you know, when we, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to tell you uh, my personal experience. When I learn new things in mathematics or statistics and I realize that I get that, uh, of course, I can treat myself in a way I can say, okay, Maybe let me just go and give myself something befitting. And you know what? If I don't get it, uh, maybe I'm trying to work on a problem and I, I don't get it. I'm not going to be happy at all. I can even sac make some sacrifice by not um, even eating. <laughs> you get what I mean? So this is how the reinforcement, uh, uh, you know, actually uh, work. Okay, that is how uh, it works. And, you know, one of the most exciting part of the of this learning is that, um, you know, the uh, first step away from training on the static data set. And instead of being able to use dynamic, you know, noisy uh, data rich environment, so it actually uh, brings this learning that we're talking about closer to learning style used by women. Like I said, you know, the world that we find ourselves is simply our noisy, complex data rich environment. The data, and that was why I used to tell my students, the data set that you have around is contaminated. It's okay, it's contaminated with noise. And we're basically going to be looking for a way to figure out how the noise to be able to get a signal, you know, the signal that we actually need. You get what I mean? So uh, I'm actually going to give you an example of, uh, you know, the reinforcement, uh, reinforcement uh, learning. You know, the Google DeepMind, of course, is one of the example that we're still gonna talk about uh, under this uh, reinforcement uh, learning, okay? But I'm gonna say uh, the reinforcement learning has not been used as much in the real world, okay? Uh, due to how new and complex it is. Okay, don't forget I said, you know, something that reward uh, positive stuff and punish a negative uh, uh, style. But, I'm, but, you know, a real world example is using reinforcement learning to reduce data center running costs by controlling the cooling system in a more efficient way. Okay, the algorithm uh, lends a optimal policy of how to hack in order to get the lowest energy cost. You know, we find ourselves in a world where we're gonna be thinking in a way, how can we actually uh, bring down the cost? An example, like an energy cost, you know? 
how can we lower the cost? Because when we're trying to get a strategy that can do that, then that would be, uh, you know, the, the more reward it to receive. That's what we mean. And the one that we escalate in, the one that we was in team, we are not going to uh, consider that. You get what I mean? So, uh, uh, you know, in a subsequent lecture, of course, uh, we are actually going to go deep in this and we're going to, uh, you're basically going to see how this works. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the end of my lecture today. Like I said, uh, this is just an introduction uh, to machine uh, learning. Uh, before I go today, the difference between the machine learning and the statistics is just like in statistical analysis, we actually uh, you know, start with the specification of model and we confront the model with the data set and and of course, we have a way to investigate the validity of the model. But in machine learning, uh, we make use of, a, of an algorithm that will learn the model uh, from the uh, from the trained data set. And of course, uh, and don't forget, I said this: uh, the data set is going to be split here into two. We're going to have a training part, and we're going to have its uh, set part. And uh, the significant part of the data set have to be committed to the training. Uh, the algorithm will learn the model from the training data set, and of course, the evaluation of the performance of the algorithm will basically be done through. Uh, what I call, you know, using the text uh, that I said, and uh, um, we basically gonna, we have a cross uh, validation uh, way to investigate um, the efficiency uh, of the model. Okay, and of course, uh, we have a way to fight on, uh, fight on the model if, uh, to achieve uh, maximum uh, performance. Okay, so uh, if there is anyone uh, who need a kind of a clarification, I needed to ask question before I go. Okay, so the absence uh, actually, uh, absence of question actually implies that uh, everyone is good. I want to use this opportunity to appreciate those who have attended my lecture today. I hope you enjoyed that until uh, you know, next time that I'm actually going you know, to come your way again with another exciting uh, machine learning course. Make sure you stay safe and have a very beautiful day. But for now, everyone.